Hi, I'm Helen. And I'm Sarah. And you're listening to the Squiggly Careers podcast, a weekly podcast where we talk about the ins and outs and ups and downs of work and careers and give you some ideas for action, probably a little bit of support along the way, and hopefully some things that you can discuss about your development with other people too. And every one of our episodes, of which there are over 300 now, come with a pod sheet. So it is a downloadable summary of the things that we talk about so that you can reflect a little bit more. We've got Coach Yourself questions, for example. You can dive in a bit deeper. There's lots of resources that we recommend and you can talk about it with other people too. So you can always get that on our website on amazingif.com. If you just go to the podcast page, find the podcast that you want or you need right now and you will be able to see the pod sheet and also a pod note, which is like a very swipeable summary. All there for you, all summarised in pod mail which comes out on a Tuesday too and so today we're going to be talking about ways of working in some ways I'm surprised it's a topic we've not talked about before because it's one of those phrases we all feel quite familiar with and probably talk about and actually I think in a squiggly career ways of working are probably more important than ever as everyone's moving more flexibly and fluidly between teams and projects different parts of an organization the ability to quickly understand a team's ways of working or a project ways of working I think is really critical to being efficient and effective and it feels really timely as lots of organizations at the moment I think are continuing to work out how does everybody work together post-pandemic when maybe you're working in a hybrid way maybe you're fully remote maybe everybody's back in the office every day but it feels like there's an opportunity to redefine what that looks like Certainly in my experience, hello, I don't know if this is the same for you, I think ways of working often get mixed up with or included as part of things like employee handbooks or, you know, things that you find on an intranet, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but it can then end up meaning that they feel more like policies or not things that we might get that excited about or something we don't probably spend that much time with day to day a bit like those job descriptions that you read when you're applying for a job and then you never go back to again well I feel that it's like two ends of this it's either really really formal like it's in a policy and no one ever looks at it and it's just like laborious to go and find stuff or it's so informal that people aren't sure if it's the right thing to do or not they're like well my manager says but I don't know if I'm supposed to say that or not it's like you know it's it's gone it's sort of gone <laughs> rules have gone rogue that kind of thing and I think what we're trying to say is that actually to be really effective we want to surface these ways of working not stick them in a pan book so that no one ever reads them but also not make them so random that people are still a bit unsure if they're doing something good or bad with it like really surface it like really be transparent co-create things so it feels like a like an empowering thing for people a positive a positive thing for them in terms of the way that they work rather than a sort of a, a policy that gets stuck in you know a document and it always reminds me, actually, of a sort of a pre-pandemic conversation about ways of working. I do think there's like a, a marker in time, isn't it? Because I think ways of working have changed so much because of the pandemic. But a pre-pandemic conversation with a lady called Jodie from Money Supermarket, who we did lots of work with. And I was talking to her about their flexible working. Well, I said their flexible working policy, because at the time they were really progressive. And I said, oh, you know, talk to me a little bit more about your flexible working policy. I'd like to learn about it. And they said, well, first things first, Helen, it's not a policy. It's more of a principle. And they said, we don't, we don't want a policy that gets stuck in a document this is more about our culture as a business and therefore it's much more of a principle and that point always stuck with me that if you want these things to be embedded in the way people are working then a policy can often feel too formal but a principle can often feel maybe just like you know a bit more cultural just the way we do things around here rather than what gets written in a book yeah and I think that's really interesting because we know that when people have got autonomy and freedom that's when people are happiest at work so I think there's potentially a danger sometimes with these kind of things that you then get so formalized you take away the thing that matters most but when we do think about why ways of working are important we also know that people benefit from and really appreciate clarity so on how we do things around here if that is all unsaid or you have to second guess that's quite stressful for people particularly if you're new or perhaps you see different people doing different things so it gives everybody a sense of shared knowledge and understanding and it stops the unwritten rules which I think can be really confusing and particularly when we are also interdependent on each other I think to progress and succeed in our jobs and in our careers it's just really good to know how are we going to work and to actually 
transparently and openly make some choices and decisions about that. I've been thinking about this a lot over the past couple of weeks because we've been working on our ways of working for Amazing If, hence the podcast topic. (laughs) And um, you realise just how much you don't write down or how maybe part of a team could be doing things in one way and another part of team could be doing things in a different way. And maybe that's just happened organically and sort of for very good reasons but actually is that still useful is that still sort of serving you as a team and even when I'm doing workshops I'll often say as a very specific example to people you know as a team do you all need to have notifications on or do you all have notifications on and everyone will be like yeah yeah we all have notifications on and then I'll ask a question like well do you need to and then you sort of get a bit of a mixed Mm. response well some people say like oh I do need to and some people like oh actually I'm not sure I've not really thought about it And then I will say to people, as a team, have you ever talked about or agreed how you view sort of using tech and particularly in terms of notifications to just keep it really specific? And the answer to that is pretty much always no. But some people are definitely assuming I must have my notifications on. That is a must do. Whereas other people are like, oh, no, well, I'm choosing this. And then other people are just not sure. So I think it's just one of those areas that often gets missed because it will always feel like you know like it never ends up being top of to-do lists um it never ends up feeling like a priority but if you invest in it you know the sort of the medium term gains I suspect far outweigh the short term oh we've got to have a few conversations we've got to figure this out as a team I suspect it's it's always worth it if you spend time on this and other than us who are on obviously a mission a very conscious mission with this who do you think in terms of the companies that you've worked for have approach this best like most collaboratively most transparently I don't think I have a standout example in terms of who I've worked for I've been very impressed with I've been researching some organizations that open source their they are more employee handbook slash ways of working documents and they're often what's described as asynchronous remote first organizations so almost from the nature of how they work They've got very, very good at ways of working, of really thinking about it, asking useful questions, involving people, and then writing it all down in a really kind of simple and straightforward way. There's a company, I'm not, I've never come across them before. I don't know if you've heard of them called Oyster, who I think do hiring. So I think they're sort of a HR organization. And there's actually a really long list. And I'll put all these links of organizations that do share their ways of working just for everyone to read. And I read those and I was like, right, that is the benchmark. Some of these are really impressive and they've definitely inspired some of the things that we're going to talk about today in terms of the places I've worked they've tended to be a bit more formal (laughs) a bit more um, policies on an intranet that probably you only accessed if you needed to I have worked in a probably one team where as a leadership team we might have had some chats about ways of working but interestingly as I again as I was researching and thinking about this I couldn't pinpoint or remember very many of these conversations. You know, I, I've had teams where I felt like this has been better than others, but I don't think I've ever been part of a team that's addressed this brilliantly. That's what I'm hoping, obviously, we're now going to go away and do. But, uh, <laughs> the high what bar. about you? Well, I think I had some involvement with Hoxby, which is an organisation run by Alex Hurst and Lizzie Penny, and they had a fully sort of distributed work force from the outset of building that business and they used like slack really sophisticatedly before I saw a lot of other companies doing that and so I I look at what they have done and how they've built Hoxby and I think it's a brilliant example to the extent that they've written a book on it called work style so they you know they have really looked at how to do this and then shared those ideas with other people but I was also sort of reflecting on other places that I've worked and early on in my career I worked for a company called Capital One and I worked in project management for them and what they were particularly good at was when you started a project off you'd have like a project team charter where you know this this project would be made up of people coming together for a finite period of time from different functions in the business and as part of that sort of kickoff to the project you would have this moment in time where you sort of agreed like how are you going to have meetings it was a bit less sort of platformy tech based then to be honest because that we're going back a little bit mm-hmm. in terms of the ways of working as a project team it, it was a conversation that was had and it, a, a discussion about well how are we going to come together and how are we going to resolve disagreements and you know we will learn by doing lessons learned all that stuff was covered and it made me think that that might be common practice for projects now, but 
it's sort of easier to do in some ways or it seems easy to do with a project because it's something that has mm. a, a neat start point whereas often teams don't often have a neat start point you know everyone's coming together day one on a team together these teams are often pre-existing so it can sometimes feel like when are we supposed to have this conversation project team day one it makes sense but a team that's on day 742 does it still feel relevant and I would say yes absolutely this is I think something that you maybe you discuss annually and you, you review within that year is it still working for us so I guess my point is I think it is relevant for everybody but I can see why in some situations it might feel easier to start so when we're thinking about ways of working, we want to, I guess, break this into some simple things that we can move forward with. So there are three areas that are useful to address when we're thinking about what are ways of working. The first is roles and responsibilities. So does everyone know what everyone does? And does everyone know how we make decisions around here? So that's kind of a useful starting point to make sure the point that Sarah said on clarity, you know, when, when you don't have that clarity, the sort of um, ambiguity about responsibilities there's a lot of crossover it can become a little bit dysfunctional so roles and responsibilities area number one second tools and tech increasingly important now like what tools are we using and how do we use them I think when we don't discuss this and I've seen this in lots of businesses that I've worked in you have like a couple of people who use one bit of tech a couple of people who use another and then it all becomes really frustrating because some people are communicating on whatsapp and some people are putting things in shared documents and it just it it duplication, frustration, not that fun. So having those conversations and creating some clarity around tools and tech is really, really useful. And then the third one is about your team rhythms and your rituals. So rhythms might be the meetings, like when are your regular meetings? What do we do remotely? When do we come together? And then what are those moments that I think are sort of uniquely you as a team? Those, those rituals that you do that maybe other teams don't do, but help people to feel like that this is this is a distinctive and different team that they're working in. So there's sort of three areas that we think are important to explore when you are looking at your ways of working as a team. Just before we dive into some questions, maybe to ask yourselves as a team, some tools, some options to explore, and then what, just what we've used from our experience, just a few principles from the research and the reading that we've done that I think are really important before you get started. The first one, as Helen's already mentioned, is about being adaptive. So your ways of working are not set in stone. If something starts working against you rather than for you, there should be that shared accountability and ownership to call that out and to say, well, we have been doing this, but this is starting to feel frustrating or this doesn't feel like it's working. Perhaps our team has changed. Perhaps it's doubled in size and that means your ways of working need to change. And when I was reading lots of organisations who share those, you can really get that clear sense of, oh, maybe previously we've done it this way but we have learned something along the way and now we've slightly adapted it to make it work even better for us so I think I was reading one by I think it was a company called Post Hog which is for engineers quite a techie company from from what I could understand when I was reading about it and they talked a bit about their application of OKRs so objectives and key results which lots of organizations use and they sort of talked about what we used to do it in this way but we've just made some adjustments that probably reflect our culture maybe the nature of our work to make them even more useful so I think just that it's always work in progress is good to have in mind. Second principle that it's specific to you and your context. And I think when you read really good ways of working examples from organizations, you get a real feel for what it would be like to work in that company, whether you'd want to and whether it would be right for you. So this should feel right. This should feel right for your team or if you're doing it at an organization level, you know, across your organization. So I don't think you have to copy or feel like oh we must use this word or we must use this way of describing it so you know we were saying I quite like ways of working that sort of makes sense to me but I've seen other people say operating manual or operating system or employee handbook so even I think the language and the words that you use need to feel right for your culture the third principle is that it needs to be co-created I think if this feels like it's written just by one person it's very unlikely to achieve the advantages and the upsides that you get from really effective ways of working. So you need to involve people and it needs to feel like something that everybody has. Almost you've got to have shared accountability for it because there's no point Helen and I saying, oh, we're all going to use tools and tech in this way. And then if nobody understands it or nobody does it, you're not achieving anything. Nothing is different. So it has to I think feel like it belongs to everyone rather than belong to an individual. 
even though one individual might be you know responsible for updating some of the documents or whatever it might be and then the fourth area which is not really a principle it's just more of a suggestion and partly a thank you from me is to those organizations that do open source their ways of working it is a really brilliant example of where people have just thought do you know what why why wouldn't we share this externally if that means that we can help other people to get better like why wouldn't we do that in the main i've seen people create these on a platform called notion which i'm still learning and getting my head around like how that works it's not a million miles away from something a bit like an intranet, I guess, but quite easy to use. So you could even create your own notion for your team. It wouldn't have to be for your whole organization. And as far as I can see, it feels free. Everything I've discovered so far is free. I'm sure at some point they must make you pay for something because I don't know how they make any money. But there is a lot out there that you can learn from and be inspired by. And I've definitely thought, oh, I'm going to borrow some brilliance from this company. Or I like that idea, but what would that mean in the in the context of Amazing If? So I definitely have a look at those links that I have shared. Again, those are from people who are sharing loads of different ideas and people who sort of live and breathe this stuff every day. So really amazing to see that. It's probably the best example I've ever seen of people open sourcing stuff in a way that just felt really generous. I think it's like this um, big sort of self-fulfilling cycle in terms of their brand, right? Because you mm. read that stuff and then you're like, wow, I want, I want to work in a company like that. Why don't I go and work for a company like that? So actually by sharing it, they're not kind of giving, I don't know, they're not really giving it all away. They're just sort of almost celebrating what they're doing. I think it's it's generous, but it's also smart, right? It's, it's a source of competitive yes. advantage yeah, for them. Yeah. So it's like really, it's really smart at the same time. So what we want to do now is want to take those three areas that we talked about, roles and responsibilities, tools and tech, and then rhythms and rituals, and just give you a question to consider for you if you're approaching this, and then some options to explore, and then just share a little bit of what we've sort of tried and tested ourselves. So if I take the first one, the first one we talked about was the roles and responsibilities. And a question for you to consider in this area is how do we make smart decisions in our team and organization? So hopefully that'll prompt some thoughts on what you might already be doing well, which is often a good place to start. And then some options to explore if you want to improve how you're looking at roles and responsibilities. There might be some models like RACI. Again, I saw a lot of this in project management land. Responsible, accountable, consulted and informed from my memory of my days in project management. And Sarah, you'd kind of know about the rapid model as an alternative to RACI. Yeah, and I think all of these acronyms essentially try to do exactly the same thing. But RAPID is recommend, agree, perform, provide input. I always feel like that's cheating a little bit where you have to put a word before <laughs> it. And decide. And I think the slight difference with that is it doesn't specify the order in which you have to do things. But it's all about, I think, again, it's just about being very transparent about who's doing what. And in terms of what we've actually done, one thing that I have tried and tested that I found quite useful, mainly to make a team sort of realize how interconnected they were. So I was at the time managing this team who felt a bit siloed, to be honest, like everyone was working in a slightly different way on slightly different areas. And it felt like there was sort of a random collection of people rather than like a what I would think of as like a high performing and so I put loads and loads of like I just remember getting loads and loads of flip chart and I put everybody's name on the like this flip chart sort of spread around it and then I got everybody to draw they all had the different color pen and I got them all to draw the interconnections between them like so in order for you to be at your best who do you need to work with or who do you need to get sort of work from and draw the lines between you and it was a really interesting so they had arrows going from people and arrows going to people I've got everyone in the team to do it and this was probably in terms of the amount of people this was maybe about 12-ish people something like that and what actually ended up was was a mess a mess on a wall <laughs> to be honest that we then kind of you know we talked through the arrows and the directions and the colors and who was kind of almost like hub people because they had a lot of them so it led to some really interesting discussion but the main realization at first was that wow this is a very interconnected team we might think we're operating in silo but actually if we don't come together and understand who needs what when and who's responsible for what and how then this could all turn into quite a big mess and so just that visualization of it worked well and if you are like quite a remote team I mean at the time I did that in person 
But you could use a tool like Miro, just the same to plot this all out so that people can see that on a screen. You don't have to get together in person to do it, but it's quite a useful way of just understanding the interconnections and then to help you to sort of refine some of those roles and responsibilities a little bit more. And I think one of the other things that I've noticed on a couple of the external examples that I saw is how explicit people are about making decisions. So, you know, sometimes you get into analysis, paralysis, or things don't move as quickly as they should, or people just are not clear about, well, whose decision is this? So there is a company, again, this is on Notion, so anyone can go and read, I think you pronounce it Juro, maybe, their handbook, so J-U-R-O, is that how you pronounce that, Helen? Juro, do you think? I, I would have, yes, I would come to the same conclusion. Yes. <laughs> Um, so I do, I hope I'm not pronouncing their company name wrong, but they even have a section in their handbook called how to make better decisions. I've put that link for you in the podcast show notes and they just share a framework of like basically going, if you need to make a decision, they give you a bullet point checklist and, you know, they ask just really simple questions like what is the question we are deciding? Why now? And then the next one is what impact do we expect this decision to have metrics team other And they sort of ask things like, what kind of decision is it? Does this decision have a high upside or a high downside? And so they distinguish between, and they use Daniel Kahneman's work on like systems thinking. So if it's system one decision, basically you can just make the decision and move on. Like don't overthink it, don't spend too long on it. If it's a system two decision, so perhaps you just need to dive a bit deeper, you probably need a bit more data, you need to think a bit about options. It then again gives you sort of, how to make a system two decision. And I shared that with our amazing if team. And actually this is the place I saw the rapid framework because they talk about that there as well. And just, they create a little table that you can literally just download and use. So who do you recommend does the analysis? Who must agree with the decision? Who's going to perform the actual work? Who's going to do the work? Whose input do you need? Who's going to make the final decision? And I just read that and just thought that is so clear about kind of how to go through a decision process. And the other very famous example, I guess, that I was thinking about is Amazon. So Amazon have a very clear decision-making process where, you know, with the famous one page and six pages. Yes. um, And there are some great posts that you can read from people who've worked previously at Amazon about why Amazon used those and, you know, some of the expectations around I think I could be getting it wrong. Someone from Amazon might listen and be able to tell me when you first go to a meeting, I think people actually have time to actually sit and read the one page or the six pages, but there's very clear guidelines about how you write those. And if you want to succeed there, you need to get good at it. Now you never know how much of this is sort of urban myths Myths, that surround somewhere that you, (laughs) that you don't, you don't work and you don't actually know, but I do know people who've worked at Amazon and have talked about like, you know, that is very clearly how decisions are made. And I think this is thinking about, well, what does that look like for you? In Amazing If Today, to give a very practical example, we did something called a challenge and build session. And so we're still establishing this as one of our ways of working. So we were sort of testing both an idea and the ways of working at the same time. But we write one page, which describes an idea or a proposition or just a concept that you want the rest of the team's challenge and build on. You send that one page out to everybody at least two days before, just to give people a bit of time to read and reflect if they want to. And then we spend an hour together on challenge and build. And the idea is the person who's written that or the people who've written that, their job is to really be in listening mode. And everybody else's job is to give their sort of fresh eyes feedback. What were their first thoughts? What were the questions they've got? And it created a really good discussion today with the idea that we'd shared with our team it felt like quite a different way of working, something that we wouldn't normally or kind of naturally do within our week. So again, I think sometimes you have to test these things to figure out, did that feel right? And I think Helen, you and I both came out of that conversation going, oh, that felt really amazing if, it felt useful, which is like our, our number one value. It felt energetic and everybody could contribute. So it just started, we're at the start of that being kind of, is that a way of working or is it not? But it certainly felt like it had got something in it. And just to connect it to the point of roles and responsibilities, I think what the team mapping exercise and things like challenge and build helps you to do is to get away from hierarchy because 
they are free of hierarchy. The, the challenge in Bill, you don't need to be the, the leader of the team to do that. Anyone could put an idea forward and then they position themselves as the sort of the listening, the listening person. And if you do the mapping exercise that I talked about, one of the things that sort of surprised me was some of the in, most influential people when you're mapping. So some of the people that have got the most lines through them are not the most senior people. They're the enablers. And it's those people that you're kind of like, oh, well, how do we kind of really help you? Because you've got a lot going through you. So if we don't, if we don't support you, then actually you're probably blocking quite a lot of work getting through. And it just takes that, yeah, that that old school hierarchical bladder like view of how work gets done. And it really helps people to play a role that they're going to be better at and to try out different things and just to look at how an organization works from a very real perspective, not something that's sort of, you know, a hundred years old in terms of the hierarchy of companies. So the second area of ways of working is tools and tech. And I think this is probably the one lots of us go to when you first think about yeah. ways of working. So what is the there's tech an app for that? There's an app for that. Yeah, yeah, there's an app for that. <laughs> uh, so a question to consider here, how do we use tech to make our life easier and our work more efficient and effective as a team? So I think that's always a good place to start because I do think with tech, you can quite quickly get lost and drawn into platforms or notifications or personal preferences but I think it is worth remembering what that tech is there for like what is the purpose of that tech or what is the purpose of that tool and one of the first options I think to explore here which I can definitely see in our amazing if team that we are getting better at but probably still not established in terms of our ways of working is understanding individual versus together tech so individual tech is sort of what you choose to use you know having the autonomy and freedom to kind of go oh well I use in the notes section of my phone or I use bits of paper or post-it notes or whatever it might be Helen uses planner in Microsoft Teams like I don't use planner but what's your together tech so what are the things where it is really important that you consistently do things in the same way so is it about the Teams channels you've got is it about notifications is it about When are you using Teams versus when do you use WhatsApp? Because I think to Helen's point, if we're just using all tech all of the time, that very quickly becomes frustrating and overwhelming. And when you're thinking about tech as well, to help a team with their ways of working, I think hardware is also as important as software. Like, so do I have a laptop that like holds its battery charge? (laughs) Because if you don't, then you can't work in many places because you've always got to have be near power, for example, or does everybody have a laptop? Because if they don't, maybe they don't have the autonomy. And so I think making sure that people have got the hardware that they need, as well as the software, it's really easy to leap to software because it's cheap, right? It's cheap. It's cheaper. There's loads of apps. There's loads of platforms and things that aren't that expensive for people. But actually, if they haven't got the hardware that works very well for them, then those software that software doesn't go very far either. So I do think you've got to have a conversation about, well, how are we setting you up for success individually as a team with the tools and techs that we use? And so, for example, for our team, we have like a working from home fund, for example, so that because the majority of our team work from home, you know, they can choose what they use that fund on. That could be a desk. So that gives, you know, that supports them. It could be a laptop or whatever, the camera so they look good on screen. It's up to them. But I do think making sure that you're supporting people with hardware as well as like, you know, platforms and stuff like that is quite important. Yeah. And I read about that in lots of these ways of working documents, which sounds like I got quite lost in, which I absolutely did because I was re- <laughs> I was really enjoying reading them. I think, you know, if you're a bit nosy slash curious, they're a dream. You're like, oh, this is, this is absolutely fascinating. And there was definitely more than one organization that I read about that talked about um, noise cancelling headphones. Hmm. You know, so because these are naturally very remote organizations and they are they want to give people that flexibility and freedom. They invest in really good noise cancelling headphones for people so that, you know, you can go and work in a cafe, you can go and work in other places and you've not got to be worried about like surround sound that might, that might come from there. So I was like, Oh, it's really interesting how, you know, almost how detailed people get. And I think they are trying really hard to think about how do we create an environment where people can like do brilliant work and do their best work and that made sense to me I was like oh the noise cancelling headphones the pet ones as well really make me laugh when people talk about like pets and what pet stuff is allowed and isn't allowed like that's, that's really funny <laughs> quite emotive isn't it like, yeah it's quite emotive <laughs> yeah yeah and so one of the things that we are again at the early stages of in Amazing If is being clear about different tech and kind of how we use it to communicate 
So we started to realize that we'd got messages flying around left, right and center on WhatsApp, voice messages, on Teams, on team channels, you know, just sort of comms everywhere and in every place. And we weren't being very considered or intentional about what do we share where. And I think that was the key question. The other thing that I've really realized as I've been thinking a lot about ways of working is just how important it is to write things down. So there might be some things that you you assume everybody knows. Perhaps you assume because you're like Helen Lai and you've sort of been in Amazing If from the start. And so you sort of go, well, of course we use Teams in this way. And you sort of forget that, okay, but I might have just joined Amazing If. How would I know that? Where is that written down? That where is that written down is a really good question. It's quite, a, I've actually found it. I'm like, oh, it's not really written down. Or it was written down three years ago in a random document that there's absolutely no way I could find it, even if I tried. And so we just agreed together, right, okay, we're going to use WhatsApp a bit more in emergencies. We've got certain teen channels that are very clearly labeled for certain things. And we also agreed that we would kind of call people out in a friendly and nice way if we were using any of those tech or tools in a way that was different from what we were saying. So if I then start messaging Lucy and our team on WhatsApp a lot during a day, is it because it's an emergency, which is what we've kind of agreed it for, you know, almost sort of instant response emergency, or actually if it's not, then she might just gently nudge me and say, oh, should we move this back over to Teams? Because that'll just be, Mm -hmm. that's where we need to keep a kind of record of it. And so I think you've sort of got to agree your way of working. You've got to write it down somewhere that everybody can easily access and keep coming back to. And I think you've also got to create a culture where as people are starting to practice it, when you inevitably forget or get a bit lazy or do something wrong, and I'm like putting myself in this category because I just know this is definitely going to be me on some of these areas, that people do just sort of go, actually, no, we need to stick here to sort of what we what we said we were going to try. One tiny build on it, and I think this might come more from me than you, is because I love tech so much. I do find it really interesting to hear the individual uses of tech. So I think it's really important to agree the together tech. But I still want to hear, like, I'm still like, ooh, what is you that tool you're hack, using? You? Well, I do love a tech hack. And I find that, like, actually, quite a lot of other people have quite smart little systems and things that they do. Like, have little things, like, what was it that, like, back to Lucy and our team, she, whenever she's sort of doing doing some adding up, <laughs> adding up on something she'll use Siri to check her sums and she'll be so and I thought oh that's a quick little help just ask Siri what x is but there's just little things or I use Otter for example if I've had the first of a series of meetings that I'm going to be having with somebody what I will often do is use this app called Otter and I will take two minutes after that meeting to just summarize what I said and what I thought I heard so that it's sort of in a bank and then before the next meeting I'll just play that little two minute clip back to myself so it it sort of brings me back to that moment and I find that I don't have to keep so much in my head it's sort of like a sort of second brain on my phone to just put that conversation in while it's fresh and there's lots of little things like that that it might not become sort of like together tech but to be honest until you talk about individual tech you don't really know how to improve your collective tech so I do think there's a you know being curious about what other people are using for their own personal ways of working can help you to identify some things you can do differently as a team. I loved it when you you asked our team that question. You were like, oh, you know, what tech hacks have you got? And I was like, I literally have not. You're, I mean, you entirely opted out of that. Everyone else <laughs> like, I do this, I do that. And you're like, what? No, I, I didn't opt I didn't, out. I, <laughs> I just didn't have anything to say. I just didn't have anything to share. I was like, I don't know. I've got a phone. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I have the notes app. It's full of many notes. <laughs> I do. I do use the notes app on my phone quite a lot. But do you use um, hashtags in, a... in your notes app to make it easier to search for all of your notes? No, but I don't need to because it's yeah. just it's my own. It's my own system. It's my own like. <laughs> but I do think that point about just experimenting, and I think what is really good is when you do know people's individual tech. If there is something that's sort of universally useful, then it can go from individual to together. Mm. And you often read actually in in my favorite ways of working documents. I really liked that they often had a bit of a mix between well, this is what we all do. So they might say, well, here's all of our together tech. And that's a name that we've made up, by the way, not one that that they've used. So here's our together tech. And then they might have like a separate page, which is just like ideas to inspire. And that's where, for example, you might have all of your individual ideas. Mm. And I did read a lot of that from these ways of working documents, like, oh, just here's some really interesting reading if you want to improve your decision making. Or if you're into careers, if you're into career development, 
you know, you could imagine people going, well, go and have a look at Squiggly Careers podcast and go and have a look at all these free resources. I was actually, do you know what? I had a, I had a tiny hope that one of the ways of working documents might have Squiggly in them because the organizations are actually often really good at career development, but I didn't see Squiggly. We've not, we didn't make the cut so far. So I was like, that's a new, a new ambition is to see Squiggly in an open sourced ways of working document from a company. Cause I think those companies would naturally embrace Squiggly. So we're yet to feature but uh, I could imagine that being something that Maybe we our, could help those companies with. Our squiggly spotters. Our squiggly spotters can, yeah. can let us know. Okay, so our last area that we want to talk about was this idea of rhythms and rituals. So, you know, regular meetings, reviews, the things that you do that are uniquely you as a team. And so a question for you to consider here is what are the meetings and moments that matter the most? And I think a sensible place to start, given how much time we all spend in them, is your meetings. So when you're just thinking about as a team, what is your approach to meetings? I saw this in lots of the documents, you know, does every meeting have to have an agenda, for example? One of the things that we know from Priya Parker, who was on the podcast talking about gatherings, is the single biggest failure of most meetups in any walk of life is that they're not purposeful. Does every meeting invite, for example, that you send out within your team, does it have to have a single sentence that describes the purpose of that meeting? Like, I think that's quite a good idea. That's not something that we do in Amazing If. I'm like, I, I can fit, see how that would be a good idea. So, you know, how are you on meeting agendas? What about meeting times? You know, lots of organisations I know are now experimenting with, okay, well, actually you do 20 or 40 minute meetings because we're trying to encourage people to spend less time in meetings. Do you do stand-up meetings? And I think obviously it goes beyond meetings. It might go into things like one-to-ones. It could go into things like, I think you could have things like career conversations in here. You could have things like, like we have walk and talks. We have quarterly walk and talks in Amazing If. And then you might get into things that feel a bit more like moments rather than meetings. So things like we have mistake moments in Amazing If, make a mistake, we share it on Teams, we talk about what we've learned. This is where you could have things about feedback, what worked well, even better if. So this is really, I think this is where you get into the sort of the, almost the people kind of aspect of like when we get together or when we sort of do things that is going to make our work better like what does that look like and these are things I think you often you should feel proud of you know you should feel proud of your like do we feel proud of how we approach our meetings I bet most people are like no we just don't want to be in them like what would make you proud of meetings what would make you think oh I'm really looking forward to that moment in a day and I do think it is often helpful we've seen and I know the organizations that we've worked with have seen it's helpful for them to feel ownable and to feel like you like our mistake moments feel really like hers what worked well even better if it's very amazing if walk and talks I know loads of people do walk and talk so we're not unique in that but we all love them as a team every time we all do walk and talks we all really enjoy them so they're not going anywhere you know they're one of our rhythms they're part of our ways of working again if you said to me where is this all written down for amazing if I, we, we couldn't show you we, we haven't done that that's what we're sort of in the process of doing now is going what have we already got that we think is going really well? What gaps have we got? And actually, what are we just going to leave that's more individual where we don't, it doesn't, not everything needs to make it into kind of a ways of working document. And there's a few provocations here. I think that if you said to people, you can only keep three meetings from this week, <laughs> which ones would you keep? Like everything else is like, it goes, which three would you keep? I think that would be really interesting. Like I would definitely have, we have a Monday morning meeting, which if mm-hmm. I feel like is a really good way to just, kind of see everybody and connect with everybody at the start of the week because then everyone works quite independently for the rest of the time I would always have a Sarah and me meeting like I always feel like a loss if Sarah and I haven't just had a moment to share and discuss and progress some stuff together and then I'd have to really think about that if I could only have three I'd have to really think about what that what that third one would be that would I would feel help me in the business I can't answer it now but I think it'd be a good if you had that conversation with everybody and then to see those and I think then the second provocation is if you were to even better if each one of those meetings it's obviously already still quite important to you because you've identified it as one of the top three but if you were to even better if it just one thing for each of them like what would you do because imagine if the three meetings that mattered the most to you each week just got a little bit better then I think that would be an important way of like sort of taking stock a little bit and, and and moving something forward and then something specifically that I've seen done really well and it really helped me when I joined a business actually was when I joined Microsoft 
a lovely guy called Rob, who was my manager, talked me through the Rob. Rob talked me through the Rob. So the Rob was the rhythm of the business. And it was full of a lot of acronyms, but quite complicated. <laughs> but he basically, on a big whiteboard, he drew out the year at Microsoft, particularly in the team that I was in. And he went through like the quarterly meetings and then what happened before them. And he drew a rhythm of the business for me so that I had a really clear view of what was coming and what I needed to get engaged in and why those moments mattered to the business and how I would be contributing to them. And as somebody coming into the team, A, there was a rhythm of the business that was pre-existing, like that was already there. And second, that somebody, it was so clear that somebody could communicate it to me by drawing it out and I remember seeing that and thinking it was just really it was really powerful it wasn't it wasn't debatable it was it was the rhythm of the business you know it had an acronym the Rob and I would quite like us to have a rhythm of business and it's not as we said before it's not set in stone it's not like you can't decide as a team that something isn't working anymore but it was quite nice to have a visual of that rhythm so that I knew sort of each month and each year what moments I was working towards and so as a final thought, Helen and I were just discussing, like, how do you make all this really useful? Because you might be at different points and you might have different priorities depending on your context, your culture, your team. And I think there's, for each of those three, there's, are you in kind of one of these three modes? And it might help you to just think like what you might go away and do next. So are you in explore, where you're just thinking, we need to explore what tools and tech we want to use and we need to try some stuff out and we sort of need to explore and experiment so we're sort of quite far maybe from something being as definitive as ways of working and I think that's absolutely fine you just you just you know what you're working towards so maybe you're in that explore and experiment maybe you've got something in place but the focus is more on improving so that would be more the examples that Helen just talked about in terms of well we've got meetings but are they as good as they could be? Are they purposeful? Have we really thought about our rhythms and rituals? Have we written down our rhythm of the business? Those kind of things. And then I think when you get to a point where you feel confident and comfortable that you kind of go, this is how we do things around, around here. Don't forget to write them down. I find that bit really hard. I think I'm, I'm never very good at like the last 20% of anything. So I get very motivated by Explore bit motivated by improve and not very motivated by capture but I have really recently seen what can go wrong when you don't write things down when you've not kind of created somewhere for this to live and breathe and kind of be dynamic and that's what those organizations who I've been reading and researching like the post hogs and oyster and duro that's what they seem to have done so brilliantly they've not overcomplicated it this doesn't need to be like a massive mammoth piece of work you know these are often just simple one pages that very clearly describe you know how you do things around here you know that rhythm of the business that how we approach meetings or decisions you know why is our company here they usually have a company vision goals mission summarized just to keep reminding people you know that's what we're here to do that's what we're trying to achieve so I think for each of those three areas your roles responsibilities tools and tech rhythms and rituals just think like where are you are you in explore improve or capture and you might be at different points on each of them and I think that's normal and and you can then just think well what should we do next what would make the biggest difference for us and our team where have we got the most energy to kind of spend some time and we would love to hear from you about this episode and this topic because we'd love to learn from you. So if there are things that you are doing in <laughs> any of these can areas, I steal stuff from? <laughs> whose brilliance can we borrow? I think might be a better phrase. <laughs> no. But we'd, we would really love to know, like if there are things that you do in, in these areas or outside of them that you think really help your ways of working as a team, please let us know. Just email us. We're Helen and Sarah at squigglycareers.com because you will be helping us in our thinking about the team so that we can help more people with their careers too. And as we said, right at the start, everything we've covered today will be summarized in the pod sheet you can get it on our website you can get it in the show notes you can get it from Podmail every week on a tuesday and next week we're going to be talking about learning in the flow of work so how you learn in the moment particularly as a team so i hope that these two episodes back to back will actually feel quite connected and they might be two things where you listen to our ideas in terms of learning in the flow of work and some of those ideas could be things that might become 
rhythms and rituals or might become part of your tools and tech who knows so hopefully that'll feel like a useful next topic for everybody but we'll be back again next week with that episode so bye for now everybody bye for now